Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Sandy. It's been a long time. It has. It's been, I think, four weeks since we spoke. That's entirely unacceptable. <laughs> yes, it is. But you've been very busy, haven't you? You've been doing all sorts of things with other people and people far more important than I. I occasionally have been doing things, but you know, you're the one going to the theater all the time, but we're <laughs> back. So it's all, it's all good. Um, okay. So this evening, infinity or infinitely now rather, um, thinking about how art might get us to understand infinity or get us close somehow to infinity, infinity now. Anyway, conversation with Bill Wadman, that's you. Yeah. Mm infinite can you begin to approach what the infinite is in your mind um well no but if i can i think i could do it a lot better in my mind than i could do it with my eyes okay i think um, the minute you... you bring it into reality it's you know limited Right. Have you ever experienced anything though where there's like a, a sense of just like a falling away of um space or time or space and time? Uh sure, in small little bits in experience, but you know, I have a lot of knowledge about manned space programs and thinking about these people up there looking off into absolutely nothing and there's nothing all the way to the edge of the universe in that direction. I, do, I always think about that. Mm. It freaks me out a little bit. Does it? I was going to say, does it makes it? me very uncomfortable in the same way that a going swimming in the ocean far out from shore scares me. Sort of the abyssal underneath me is terrifying. Mm. But really, I suppose in the ocean, even at the deepest fathoms, there is an end to it. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Like imagine being in space, you're floating in space and then your watch or your clock breaks. And now you have zero sense of time. There's no way to measure it except for what's going on in your head. Do you think that we can ever accurately do that? Do we measure have time? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think we can very accurately measure time. I don't know that if I don't know that we perceive time accurately. That that's what I mean is if we didn't have those kind of tools. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Mm. I, mean, I mean, in it, short quantity, sure, but not for a long time. Yeah, but I suppose we understand, you know, sunset, sunrise. Yeah, this is why people trapped on islands, you know, mark down the days. Because mm. they would just blend into each other. Mm. Life is feels infinite at times, doesn't it? Does it? Well, tomorrow there will be another morning and then another night and then a morning, a morning and another night, and another classroom and another speaking of seeing with Bill Wadman. <laughs> you know, you would be so lucky, Bill. <laughs> um, uh, I think that there's something to. I think, I think the the length of our lives make them feel something close to infinite and yet at the same time especially as you get older they quickly feel so limited you know and it's that tug that that conversation between those two that makes life worth living well first image this evening is that is graph paper <laughs> the painting who is that Agnes Martin. Mm, sure, Agnes Martin. Yeah. You know where this one is? This might be in MoMA. Might be. If it is, I don't think it's hanging because I would know it if it was. Mm. Well, she painted There's this a... in 1963 when she'd moved away from, I mean, primarily and in her early career, she only painted in black, white and brown. And then she really diversified. <laughs> um, Into one light shade of red, yeah. Well, I mean, the color she uses, if you know other Agnes Martin paintings, they're always very subtle. Sure. Um, in that way, to me, anyway, they're very, very appealing because um, too much color for me is uh, kind of, it's too stimulating, it's too much. So I find Agnes Martin's paintings um, 
very soft, but I also, I can look at them for a very, very long time. Um, and I, I was wondering, you know, in my appreciation of someone like Martin's work, if I, if I myself might go into that sort of zone of the painting or indeed into a, a, a place where suddenly, again, space and time might fall away, even though structurally Martin's work is usually based around grid or a repetition of, of line somehow on these mm. soft uh, washes of colour. Um, but also thinking about Martin herself in the act of painting, you know, there's a lot of alignment in her work with Taoism, um, and she was very interested in Eastern philosophy. Certainly to me, there always has seemed to be a very meditative quality to her work, where the rest of everything sort of seems to fall away. And because often these images are very large, um, they, they are immersive, I can feel myself kind of entering the space of them, but also feeling that really they, they go on forever. They have the capacity to go on forever. And, and I, I find that was a lot of abstract painting. Uh, she rallied against being called a minimalist. She preferred, I think, to be called an abstract expressionist actually. Uh, but in well. her abstract works, you know, is there a sense for you, as there is for me, that this is something that has, that is infinite? It's, this painting is in some ways in line with the first thing I said when you asked me, which is that to some extent, this is the starting place of someone who's going to work prospectively, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I've got my grid. Here's my point, doing some diagonals, and then I start painting. Mm -hmm. But but in that, before it has any sort of shape in that way, it is a a a, a blank slate of space, right? It's in the same way that my perception of infinity while falling asleep with my eyes closed is closer to reality than anything I can actually see with my eyes. In some ways, this being such a basic representation of space being a grid like literally a you know the definition of a cartesian plane in some ways um means that it could be anything and it could go on forever as you said uh mm -hmm. does it bother you that it's not they're not squares that it's not correct as no, it were i think that's what i what i love about it actually see that's what i hate about it this is where you and i Differ. I'm like, if you're going to make graph paper, make it accurate. Well, as we've already established, it's definitely not graph paper. Yes, but at the same time, if if what you're doing is a grid, it is a grid with character. And that character itself is something that to me is non-infinite. Right. Okay. So, so it takes that, me out of it. That is something that I I, I absolutely agree with. So, uh, I mean, I imagine myself, I remember myself um, in, for example, Tate Modern, approaching an Agnes Martin painting. There was a, a really excellent Agnes Martin retrospective at Tate Modern a few years ago. And it really was, for me, it was so beautiful, nourishing to be there with the, these works. Um, and so I might approach the painting. And as I said, there could be a collapse for me of uh, a sense of time or of space. But then the longer I spend with them, my actual time that's passing along as I engage with the viewing of each image, I do notice the detail, the hand of the artist. And of course that immediately shuts the possibility of the infinite. Yeah, um, exactly. It's, it this, suddenly feels like it's has purpose and in, mm -hmm. infinity isn't purposeful. No, and um, yeah, I, I've thought a lot about this recently where, you know, as soon as I'm, I'm, as soon as I'm I'm there, then nothing ceases or infinity ceases. I, I, in that yeah. also, I just want to qualify, I, I find nothingness is infinite. And so infinity to me is also nothingness somehow. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as some of you will know, you know, Bill, that I like things that are 
have this kind of quality of, no of nothingness, if there could be such a thing as a quality of nothingness. But um, things are spare and empty. I do enjoy minimalism and I love abstract expressionism. But I also observe myself being jolted into a sense of place or time in work such as this, where I have for a moment almost a glimpse, kind of like an insight, I suppose, um, that I don't, I don't want. I'm not searching for it, but it just is, is there. And then something pulls me back. And then I am there. I am there. The I, my mm -hmm. myself. And but when when you when your ego reattaches in that way, mm -hmm. that pulls you out of it. Yeah. In the same way that when I notice the hand of of Agnes Martin, I'm yanked back out of it as well. Yeah. So there has to be a suspension, really. But again, I can't seek to suspend knowledge of Agnes Martin and I can't look to um, absent myself because in so doing I make a fool of it you know you, I, can't, if, I can't want to be nothing if you know what an artist looks like if you've seen a photograph of them or something yeah when you think about them do you see the photograph in your head like if I say Picasso does a picture of Picasso pop up in your head um, yeah, Picasso is actually an interesting one to talk about, really, because um, I don't know why you're asking this, really, but with someone like... Well, I just, you know, like the, the minimalism of this, and then you say Agnes Martin, and I picture a picture of Agnes Martin. Mm. Maybe that's just me being a weird portrait person. I don't know. That's that's what kind of what I was getting at. No, I, I think, um, you know, many times with, with art that I've really deeply loved... I've had kind of like, um, I guess, imaginary relationships with the artists. Yeah. Often, as much as I might have had relationships with the paintings. And sometimes I have imagined, and that's why I was in, saying in the case of Picasso, I really tried to, to get to know him. It's been quite important for me because he was such a shit. Did, did Picasso and Agnes Martin know that you were having relationships with them at the time? Or <laughs> was this... Well, of course, out in the yeah, okay. I mean, energy. You're like Pablo was very good to you over those years, yeah. <laughs> yes, I was. I was his uh, telekinetic lover. Yeah. Across a different time span entirely. I think he died. The, did he die the year before I was born? I can't remember. But anyway, Bye. um, yeah. yes, approaching the infinite, being with the infinite, cannot in be. I cannot be with the infinite. It It's interesting to me because this one, even though the next one is probably more, if I showed you those two and said the word infinite and said, which one matches that better, this one would probably match that better. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same, in my mind, and yet at the same time, the first one is actually a more conceptually interesting one to me because this one to a large extent is is cheating yes. like you're you're using tricks of physics aka mirrors to create this world right mm. which which tricks the mind in your eyes into feeling like this room goes on forever anybody who's been in a house from the 1970s will know what a big wall of mirrors looks like um, I don't know. It's just, it's, um, I think the thing that makes this one is the lights. Mm -hmm. Cause then you can multiply the billion stars going out in every direction. But the thing I would like to see this one in real life anyway. About this. Is, is the presence of the, the presence of the, the, the self. Yeah. You know, and you're also, going to see yourself in the mirror. Yeah. Also because of the kind of, almost like a tawdry nature of it being so tricksy it is a trick. And yeah. it, I mean, it's obviously a trick 
and I love magic and I, I don't mind being tricked but there's something so sort of sad about the small scale of the actual room yeah uh which it kind of challenges my perception of the importance of the work actually I mean Yayo Kusama first started experimenting with mirror rooms in about 1965 she's been doing it a long time relative to her span of career and she wanted to do it I think primarily to extend the sense of what she was doing in her paintings on a, on a very kind of a, almost like a procedural way but then this kind of work has really gotten to the point where um you know i was reading that she wanted to explore the kind of standard i guess tropes about infinity and and particularly things like life and death and what's after life and that vast the vastness of what we don't know really and you know trying to represent that as an artist you know what what a conundrum how to sure. how to represent the infinite but like you, I find greater um, clarity for that with Ma uh, with Martin's work uh, because well, I don't I don't feel that there's a trick to it. And and again, much as yeah. I love magic, I don't I feel that this has its it has magic to it. Well, the, the minimalism of this one is actually it. You have to do more work, and in doing so, I feel like the viewer owns the success of it a little bit mm. in this in the way that the other one is a disney ride yeah a little bit i mean i still think that everybody ought to clamor to see it where is this one it's at tate modern she's got a, an exhibition running i think it runs till the end of april now they've extended it because it's been wait was it there when i was there mm -hmm. oh how did i miss that i thought we I went know, to every room to take my tate card you silly sausage Oh, right. <laughs> anyway, infinity. Can artists effectively represent infinity? No. No. Can we, as observers, see infinity? No. I think that our minds are built in such a way where we don't like nothingness. We fill nothingness with something. We we do. Do you think that there's some, seems silly to ask if there's a value to infinity. Um... <laughs> have, have you ever been, um, do you ever go to a cave, like a cavern? And you go down and then at a certain point, the guide says, all right, we're going to shut the lights off now. And just warning you, your eyes will not adjust. There is no light here. Mm. You know, no, I've never when they turn that. off the lights. It is freaky mm. because there's nothing. It's, it's as close to nothingness as you can get. And your I eyes. Know, have you ever been in a flotation tank? I have not, although I've wanted to. Yeah. I think it would freak you out completely. <laughs> I think it might too, yeah. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. To Wait, me why me in particular? Oh, oh, well, have you met yourself, Bill? Um... <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm all over flotation tanks. You, however, <laughs> yeah. steer clear. You're searching for the infinite. I'm searching for the door. I like all of this this is it's almost like playfulness to me isn't it the kind of sense that you know are we searching for infinity we can't find it there's a bit of a kind of riddle there mm, that I like but I like that artists try to approach it the difference is I think that you know Martin wasn't trying to approach it she was it it was her it was her work um she didn't need to look for it um it became itself through this, this, this years and years of practice. I mean, she, she lived to be a very old lady. She was 92 and she died. And, you know, she, she went through just so many iterations of, of this thing. And also there's a sense that with this, the construction of this, although it would be painstaking, I'm sure, and there would obviously be 
maybe a team of many, many assistants. I, f I feel Martin's meditation. Yeah, her, her aloneness and her hand. Yes, I, I really do. And that mm -hmm. kind of comes back to this um inquiry around like whether the hand of the artist in her case uh it, either does it enhance or um kind of defer the sense of the infinite because when i think of martin and i put her in that place and infinity dies back or is not there it's not it can't be present yet when i kind of imagine martin making these works, making this painting, I also kind of approach something that though it's not infinity, it has a kind of, um, that the kind of quality of, of nothingness, of the emptying out. And also, you know, the spareness of this, I always find that something comes from nothing, whereas I'm being given everything here. Yeah, I, I, you know, we're also, not not that you are but you know there are other ways to approach infinity um infinity also means forever right so you have you know there's a there's a album by this band um uh jellyfish called spilt milk anyway the opening track sort of brings up the strings playing this ostinato and then it goes through the whole album of songs. And then the last song kind of fades into this thing of ostinato strings and goes out. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, say a CD and a CD player on repeat, it just fades out and fades back in and the album starts all over again. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being like this, this, um, this cycle, right. Um, uh, what do they call around, you know, in music, you know, where it's just sort of like going in a loop. There's also the option, I mean, we're looking at this in, in space or in, with visual stuff, but I think that there is infinite time tricks and there are, you know, musical things that feel like they go on forever. I don't know. There's lots of stuff in there. When does something end? I don't know. It's a good one. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Sandy. Short and sweet. <sighs> Knocking it out of the park. <laughs> I'll see you next week. See ya.